All right, let's get started. I'm so glad to see all of you and excited for another, another little look at the Sermon on the Mount, which, as you know, is in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And it's a place where Jesus, as I've been saying, lays out his love ethic, how he would have us live. And as Amy Jill Levine puts it, the, the scholar and author who's written the little book that we're using as our study guide, the kingdom of heaven occurs, occurs when people take the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount to heart and live them out. So it's a pretty important sermon, if that is true, and I believe that it is. So you might remember that when we started last week, we started with chapter 4. So before the Sermon on the Mount, we started with getting ourselves contextually situated. If we're going to hear the most famous sermon of Jesus, my sense is, let's see what he was doing before he, he started preaching. Um, what is the context of the sermon? So in chapter 4, you remember that we find ourselves immersed in the famous temptation scene of Jesus, where right after his baptism, he's led out into the wilderness by Satan, or the devil as it were, and he's tempted in three ways. And we might summarize the temptations by saying that Jesus is tempted with an alternative ethic or rhythm of life. The devil says to him, don't you want to go for power? Don't you want to go for esteem? Don't you want to go for, you know, sort of a means to survive no matter what? And Jesus, of course, says no at each of those three temptations. And in his elegant way, <clears throat> he says no and then essentially says God alone is good. It is upon God alone that I will depend. So I'm intrigued by the fact, I think it's a fact, that he's tempted with power, really. I mean, I think you could summarize all three temptations down into power. He's tempted with power. What we're going to get into today in verses 1 through 12 of chapter 5, which is the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, is the Beatitudes, where Jesus <laughs> lifts up the powerless, right? So right here in the gospel, we're presented in the Sermon on the Mount with this power differential. And he, he gives a, a real clinic on saying no um, to what we called last week the programs for happiness, power and control, esteem and approval, and survival and security. And then the very first thing What's that? is to lift up folks who are powerless. So what I want to do right now is hold us in just a few moments of silence. We'll do we'll do two minutes. We'll do two minutes of silence. And I'm gonna I've got a little bell that I can ring. And when I ring the bell, um, I want you just to, as you're able, just feel yourself in your body. Just beginning to let go. So maybe you you breathe deep down into your belly. You know maybe you're. If you're sort of high energy and, and all full of commotion like me, maybe you let your, your shoulders drop, you let your eyelids drop, and you're letting go as sort of you're gently saying no to the temptations to indulge in your program for happiness, right? And it's at the same time a gently letting God just sort of have you, you know? So when the bell goes off, just let go with your body. I'll hold this in two minutes. I'll ring the bell again. I'll say the Lord's Prayer slowly by myself and allow you all to emerge from the silence. And then we'll look at the sermon. So now the silence after the scripture which says, Be still and know that I am God.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Well, it's great to see everyone. Again, we're in the very first part of the sermon, chapter 5 in Matthew's Gospel today. We'll be focusing on verses 1 through 12. And the first chapter of Amy Jill Levine's book on the Sermon on the Mount. You don't have to have the book or read the chapter, but some, some of us do, so we'll refer to that along the way. <clears throat> First thing to do is to ask somebody to read the text for us. Um, who has a Bible in front of them? Uh, Anne, you've been our lector today. Do you happen? Do you want to keep going? Do you happen to have the text in front of you? Sure, I'll be glad to. Thank you. So again, we're Matthew chapter five, verses one through twelve. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right. Thank you. So, repeating, I, I know some folks have, have joined us just in the past few moments. So, repeating the, the little intro I gave, and then we'll dive in. So, we started last week with chapter 4 to get a context for this sermon. In chapter 4, we have the temptations of Jesus by the devil in the wilderness. And my summary of those temptations is that they're all temptations to some form of power. Jesus says no to all three of them. He responds to all three saying, essentially, God is alone is good. I'll depend on God. He then, the next thing he does is he hears about um, the arrest of his friend and cousin, John the Baptist. And we know how that story ends, right? John the Baptist is really brutally murdered in the end of things. And what interests me is we draw up a contrast between chapter 4 and what Jesus does in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, is that not only does Jesus not accept the devil's invitation to power, but he also doesn't exhibit power on behalf of John. He does not save John's life, does he? He doesn't rush to John's rescue and uh, prevent John from being arrested or break him free from jail. He doesn't prevent him from being beheaded from being a victim of life circumstances. 
he does move to compassion. What we'll find in our Jesus is that he's not a superhero. Rather, he always joins us in solidarity with our suffering. This is the heart of the Christian gospel. It's the intuition that our people, the Jews, Jesus was a Jew, had. There was a massive axial moment and an evolutionary moment in, in human consciousness in the 23rd Psalm. You remember the 23rd Psalm? Everybody knows the, or most, most people know the 23rd Psalm. A lot of times when we're doing uh, community services, they say, well, what should we do in this community service? There's people from all kinds of traditions. We do the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm, because everybody knows those two, or a lot of people do. The intuition that's enunciated in the 23rd Psalm is, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you protect me from evil, God, because you, you protect me from bad things happening, you know, because you're sort of a superman or superwoman in my life? Absolutely not. I fear no evil. Y'all know the text, right? Because you, oh God, go with me. Full solidarity. This is God and Jesus Christ. So right after he denies the temptations, he joins John in solidarity. He withdraws after he hears that John is arrested. So that's our context. So then, and Anne read it beautifully, of course, then we get the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount with this pitiful list of pitiful people. <laughs> Mourning, meek, persecuted, poor, pure in heart, peacemakers. Um, he's drawing up a significant contrast. So out of those 12 verses and anything that Levine is, has written in her first chapter, what, draw, what catches your attention? What grabs you? Whether it's a comfort, a confusion, it raises a question, it reinforces in you something that you, you've known all along, or, or it instructs you in some way, or, or anything else. What rises up out of the text for you? Uh, I've got something. Yeah, Joyce. Um, the first verse, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, I heard a sermon once that was very meaningful. It could have been 50 years ago. I don't know. And, but poor in spirit was explained as those who are, are hungry. They, they're they not close enough to God. There's something missing in their lives. And and their, their spirit just isn't full of joy and of God's presence. And... Uh, and that's a good place to start. Amen. And it's at that place where God calls us. It's when in myself, I, I can't, I'm not my spirit and, and God is. And so, um, that, that verse does talk to me. Hmm. It Beautiful. reminds me of where I need to be. Beautiful. Beautiful. I love how you said that's a good place to start. Because it's counterintuitive, isn't it, Joyce, that, that the, the place of deficit would be the good place. And I, I think you mean good in a real beautiful, holistic mm -hmm. way. That's a good place to start. One of my, one of my friends um, that, I'm, that we're studying this with on Tuesday mornings is a friend of mine from uh, East Tennessee. And she said to me in a conversation we were having, she said, I'm so glad we're studying the Beatitudes because I was feeling very poor in spirit last week and starting to descend into sort of a, a depressed place and just a sad place. And she said, she's very sincere. Um, and then she said, but I, then I remember Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And she said, I didn't have a lot of conclusions or answers kind of arrive in that moment, but I, I was encouraged because he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. So it's, it's okay. So kind of to your point, Joyce, it's a good place to start. And my friend sort of felt a, a, a tenderness and an intimacy with Jesus when she was experiencing that. She said, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, and I'm feeling really poor in spirit. And so he's drawing me close. He must be. He must be. Because he said, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's sweet. I liked how she wrote that uh, the blessed people have realized that they need God. Amen. And also the context in which this was written 
when she talked about this was really delivered to the four disciples who had already left their families to follow Jesus. And they had started, but he, like Joyce said, wanted them to climb the mountain a little bit further. Because I've always wondered when I send a card to someone, say like with the death, and I say, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. If that's received well, I've always, I would have received it well, but I hope people don't take it that I'm glad you're suffering. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so too. And because I think, and I think surely folks do, I mean, what he's saying here and what I think I hear you and Joyce saying so beautifully is um, when you feel like you're on the outside, you're on the inside. When you're in the depths of the, of the grief in the morning, when the beloved has died and there's just oh, such deficit and you're feeling on the very, very much on the outside, you're absolutely on the very inside of this, this fold of our Lord. I have one more that I have to share. Please, Joyce, please. I have a, a cup reading backwards that says, Blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah. But, and uh, this was a gift from my granddaughter who felt like I had I had stepped in to give, to make some peace when she was fighting with her parents. And she appreciated my peacemaking so much. Oh. That she she gave this to me just to remind me and to remind her of 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 how I had done that and I wasn't I wasn't going to say oh I'm going to be a peacemaker you know it was just yeah. a real I had to respond to what was happening so blessed are the peacemakers oh that's it that is absolutely yeah. it yeah beautiful. <laughs> So one of the things that Levine points out in, on page 8 in, in her book is the poor in spirit are people who have enough humility that they do not operate from a sense of pride. So on the one hand, the poor in spirit can very much be me when I'm feeling disconnected from God and from life itself and just feeling like, oh, my prayer life is going nowhere. That's certainly a way to read it, and I think it's a helpful way. Another way to read it, as, as Levine suggests, is um, <laughs> these are folks who, who know that they don't know. Who know enough to not be led around by pride at, at, no, at, their, own, at their own knowing. So if we're looking, and one of the things we're doing, the impetus for this study is that we're trying to look for, discover, rediscover for many of us, our own values. If love is the core value for every Christian, and it is, I think we could probably all agree, like there's one core value, it's, it's love, then what happens is love, like a molten center, like lava at the center of the earth, sort of works its way to the surface of our lives, and it manifests as these operational values. So what are our own values as we get them from operational values as we get them from Jesus. So one of the things we're looking for in the Sermon on the Mount is those values. Um, we've fought over issues and the hot topics. One of my friends said the hot topics, which I love that, that designation, for long enough. Let's start at a different place. Let's look for our own values. So the poor in spirit. If I walk into a room and, and a body of people, and I'm like, check your heart at the door, Henry. What's your value as a follower of Jesus as you seek to interact with this group of people? Blessed are the poor in spirit. I need to walk in here knowing that I do not know. And that if I can manage a little bit of the humility that the poor in the, of spirit manage, and I don't often, then God just might work through me like he worked through Joyce in that family situation. That's a beautiful share.
So, so one, when, yeah, go ahead, Jane. When I hear you say that, I think about what in our cultural narrative is the word value mean? And I know uh, several years ago, um, you know, family values was a very hot topic, yep. hot, hot label. And I feel like here today we're being, I'm being, I'm being drawn into a different idea of what is a value. Yep. And, you know, I wrote down here in my notebook, you know, like, so love is the core value. Mm -hmm. What falls under that? And for me, instead of thinking about what our culture might say is um, marriage between a man and a woman or whatever these core family values are that our culture tried to usurp that term value, I think of things like acceptance. Because when I have acceptance, both of the other human being um, and acceptance of just what come what may, so it's not that I don't have expectations. It's that I still have my hope, but I've, I've lowered my expectations to a place where I can accept what may come because I know that he's with me. Mm. So that's the two ways I think of that value that falls under love. Nicely put. Thank you. Yeah. So, Andrew, I was going to say, it, talking about the poor of spirit and being humble and not having to know all of the answers, and then, it, Jane, it goes with your acceptance and love, too, I think. I, Hendrick and I were raised by a, um, by a priest who was, I mean, one of the most out there in the public people you've ever met. So he was, he was awesome, but he was out there. So we were, it was very visible that Hendrick and I were PKs, right? So what, one of the things that translated for me uh, through my life is people like to ask me questions about what I believe, what my church believes, what God believes, right? And that has translated all throughout my whole life. And currently I have a number of people in my life who grew up in a very different church situation that often told them they were not okay and they were not accepted. And so they have a lot of baggage and hurt associated with the church. So they very much push it away. But then when they find out I'm a, you know, <laughs> church going gal, all that kind of stuff, there's a lot of, you know, they want to talk to me and ask me questions and one of the things that, and you know, I know a lot of stuff I've been around. Right. But at the same time, um, one of the things that I've really learned that one of, is one of the best things I can do is say, I don't know. Right. Like, or I think it's this, right. But maybe, maybe not. Right. And really be push away dogma, push away, right. Like the, the strict rigidity and the, it has to be this way. That is what folks some of the baggage that they have had to reject and put down. And that's, that sort of speaks to me of that poor of spirit. Yeah, that of, yeah. I, listen, I'm, I don't know it all, right? Like I, I can come at this humbly and say, this is what I think. This is what I believe. And if it, you know, as Hendry always says, right? Like if it, it doesn't sound loving. It probably isn't right of Jesus. So I come at it that way, which I think is, is part of what this is speaking to me as well. Yeah, beautifully put. And I think that, I mean, that, that builds so much on, on Jane's comment for me, Virginia, because it's like, what is my, I mean, ground level value, like, like basement level, ground level, like super foundational. I don't know. And everybody's like waiting for the next, it's like, no, that's it. That's it. I, you know, there's a humility that God has planted in me. And when I let it, come to the surface of my life, when you approach me on, you know, any of the whatever, any of the issues, first thing the poor in spirit says, you know, I don't, gosh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. This, this connects to me to the uh, beatitude, blessed are the pure in heart, because I think sometimes somebody like me who can operate on a literal level sometimes will hear pure in heart and think, oh, these are just really sweet people. But what the mystics would say, and Jesus was a wisdom teacher, so the mystics are in the wisdom lineage. What the mystics would say is pure is not like sort of morally good. It's great to be morally good, and I'm, we're all for that, and so are the mystics. But it's, it's just not that. The pure heart is the undivided heart. 
let that sink in. The undivided heart. So the undivided heart can easily and actually kind of naturally say, I don't know. The undivided heart of Jesus said um, when he was challenged, God alone is good. Don't call me good. We're not making a cult of personality here. I, I'm not your referee and your, you know, your gatekeeper. You know, sort of the, the, the pure in heart um, is that sort of, s stay with this, single-mindedness of heart. So metanoia, that word repent, means to move your mind into your heart. And the heart becomes a cognitive organ. And this doesn't happen one fine day, right? This is life's journey. But when we start processing life with our undivided hearts, then we know when to stand up for injustice, right? But we're not knee-jerk, you know, self-glorification project of Hendry Harrison. Everybody doesn't get Hendry Harrison's opinion on everything at every turn, right? They get, oh man, I don't know. And oftentimes the pure in heart will say, what do you think? And it's not because they're dodging the question. It's because they're interested in the value of relationality and, and the, the depth of the conversation. What else is in, what else is in these be Beatitudes for you? I did like her description of pure in heart. Tell Those me what page you're on. Oh, Henry. Oh, that's Henry. okay. If you don't, if you. I just have my notes. It said, those who slough off clutter of the world, money and fame and power and status, as to me, meaning that that's what drives you. I, I like to slough off clutter of the world because yeah. there is so much clutter. Amen. Um, and then I loved how she got into persecution, laughing at us to think if we have to say happy holidays one time, that <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. persecution. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, that's great. What about the meek? The meek is my current favorite one. Um, on, on page 17 in Amy Jill's Levine's book, at the very bottom, she says, the meek person is a person with great authority, but one who does not lord it over others. They do not use their power to boss others around on page 19. So if we're looking for our own values, operational values, and it, you know, yeah, that's just, language is imperfect. I'm choosing operational values. I don't know. We could probably argue with all of the uses, but if we're looking for our own operational values, and we understand that Jesus said, blessed are the meek. Then when I walk into the room, and by room I mean sort of figuratively, like when I walk into whatever situation, and if my prayer is that God would somehow inhabit me and transform me into a meek person, because I'm not that way naturally, let's say, th then I know that I'm, I'm there to help. You know? I'm not, I'm not there to, to tell people what to do and how to get you know, from A to B, because I know the best way. I'm trusted because life has taught me some things, but I'm not going to wield it. You know? When I was, a when I was young, young, younger, gosh, I just remember this. It's kind of emotional for me. When I was younger, I got an example in, in sort of what not to do. Um... Uh, an, an older person said to me when I was first ordained a priest, they said, well, Hendry, you're going to have a hard time because you've, you've, um, you've never taken care of a parent through, through their death, so you don't know what that's about. And that comment wasn't about me, it was about them, and that was projection and all that kind of stuff. But in that moment, as a young person, I heard it as really denigrating, you know, and really them sort of 
having some kind of office, they perceived some kind of office and life authority and sort of wielding it over me because I was, what, 25 and not 75? I don't know, whatever. And I'm not sort of hating on that person in this moment, but, but I was, I'm, I'm actually grateful they said that to me, you know? Because that sometimes the things that hurt us, where we're getting the counterexample, can be the things that are really instructive. So I didn't know it then. Like I, I didn't, I, I didn't know that, that that was an example and sort of the, the the counter to the blessed of the meek beatitude. But now that I'm studying it with you in this season of my life, I know what that was. It was a it was a counter instruction. Um, so I try and I don't I don't get it right a lot of time. Probably most of the time I don't get it right. But we share our, our experience. We don't wield it, you know? Um, and isn't it amazing how much, isn't it amazing both how much damage we can do and how much good we can do, you know? Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? And scary? I've got something. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think teaching through the pandemic has um, allowed me to reflect on being meek um and finding such joy in it um when the pandemic began and we were teaching virtually nobody knew what in the world we were doing and so there was sort of a um uh i don't know comfort in and not having to have it all figured out you know we're all just gonna we're all just gonna do the best we can and my goal was to just be nice (laughs) <laughs> Literally, when we first, in the spring, when we first went into it in virtual teaching, I thought, you know what, my goal is just going to be nice. I'm just going to be nice and sweet and comforting to these these kids. And now that we're back in person, I've gone back in person for one week. I'm still the virtual teacher, um, but on campus. And I've been allowed to do um, arrival duty, you know, allowing, getting the kids into the into the building. Um, and dismissal duty, saying goodbye to them because I don't have any kids on campus, so I'm available to do that. And it has been such joy, brought me such joy. Oh, I didn't know I was going to get emotional. <sighs> um, just to be at the door, yeah. welcoming them, especially that that first day when they were their eyes were wide and they were scared to death, and their masks were on and. I, it, I brought me such joy to be that person, to welcome them into that building and comfort them and get them their Pop-Tart and take them to their homeroom teacher. And so I'm thankful that this crazy pandemic has reminded me the what what's essential here, loving those babies um, and comforting and being kind and slowing down all the other, you know, mess. And let's just, gosh, so that, you know, so that's it. So this moment of meekness, being allowed to be meek and loving and slow, um, such a blessing. Well, you feel, you feel the, I feel the blessings. I feel the blessings Mm, mm. coming down and within me. Andrea, it's Cindy and everybody. Um, I don't have a great story like Kristen. That was beautiful. But um, I just think of what you said in, in, on Ash Wednesday, Hendry, as far as do we really need to publicize every thought in our head? And I, I feel like that is being meek. And I think of that every single day. And yeah. whether I'm typing something you know, on Facebook or just communicating with someone and it's really stopped me sometimes I'm not an ugly I don't think I'm an ugly person but sometimes I could maybe say that extra thing that could be taken um the wrong way or maybe not uplift someone and I just I mean I'm not always successful but I do try to just nip it now and I hope that's something that's going to stay with me hmm beautifully shared Cindy I, I never I, I didn't think about that Ash Wednesday piece being blessed or the meek but I think you're exactly right um, yeah, I don't have to lord what I have in my head, my opinion or otherwise over other people. And I think Kristen shared, you shared so beautifully about, I, I guess you're the the first sort of share to really put it on the street as far as what the blessed part means. I mean, you felt the, your, your witness is that you felt the blessing come back. And, and, and I think that that's, you're, you're really putting your finger on it, Kristen, for all of us. Jesus is not saying at a boy, at a girl. That's fine. Out of boys, fine. Out of girls, fine. But he's saying, "Blessed are." 
In other words, this is a, there's a return circuit to this thing. Blessed are. And which is an invitation into, well, it's an invitation into the flow of Trinity, y'all. I mean, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Ex creation is the Holy Trinity giving itself away. And, and manifesting is all creation. And so what we do in our baptisms and when we say yes to following Jesus is we join that flow, that, that perichoresis flow of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Kristen Harrison, and we're the fourth in the Holy Trinity, you know, literally. And so you join the flow. And so, yes, blessing comes. And then I think we all know, Kristen doesn't, but the, but the rest of us know what is to get kicked out of the flow. Because we're, you know, we do register our awfulness with the world, you know. And then we, we join back up into it. Yeah. Blessed are. Blessed are. I think your friend this week that you talked to when you wanted whatever <laughs> it is you wanted to happen. Yeah. And Virginia, happy birthday, by the way. But anyway... You know, I thought about that when you were, you know, giving your sermon about that gentleman, your friend, was saying to you nicely, you know, Henry, blessed are you that's pure in spirit at that point, yeah. you know. But, you know, oh, yeah. you never told us the end of the story. So I know you're praying for the gentle, the person who was being ugly, but... Has the situation changed just from your perspective, or has it actually changed? Yeah, good, good question. So, uh, Anne's referring to today's sermon. Yeah, so the end of that story is that I got out of the way, and it resolved itself beautifully. That's what's. That's the blessing. Like Kristen said, we got away from all the clutter yep. with the kids' problems, and they're just kids, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you got to tell us the ends of these stories. I didn't want to tie it up too nicely for you, though. I wanted I wanted you to be able to be in the down in the valley because some people are st it's still not resolved. So I wanted to be down there with them. So uh, that's great. Um, it, w one of the things that I have as my sort of thesis about the the beatitudes is that Jesus is describing people who are impoverished of something in each of the Beatitudes. So, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are, are impoverished of a need to fight. They are impoverished of that consolation for going after vengeance, right? Um, blessed are, the, are the, the, those who, who mourn because they are impoverished of this sense that... Um, uh, they can replace the beloved. They know that God alone is the one who can console their broken hearts. So what, what impoverishments do you see in, in these Beatitudes? Um, what have they given up on that is their acknowledgement that God alone can companion them in this, whatever the moment is? That's a question. Also, what else, what, just what else emerges for you in any of this? Well, one of the things, uh, it's sort of under what you just said, like, and you were teasing a little bit, but like you wanted to be in the valley, right? Like, so I think it is, part of it is blessed are those who understand that there are valleys and there are mountaintops and you don't have to be in one of the other mm. all the time. And that's not even the goal, right? Yeah, like yeah. that mm. it's a flow and it's a circle and this is the way that life is. And if you can be where you are, whether that's the valley or the mountaintop and not try to hold on to it, it makes a huge difference. That's hard to do, but it makes a huge difference then in, in your life and how you're able to maneuver, maneuver through it and the blessings that you can come to. Yeah. 
Well, and is that, is that, is, are you sort of shining a light on what Kristen's saying with her story too, where she's meeting those little ones at the door, literally and figuratively in this moment in their lives. And it doesn't sound like to me that her story says, and she hopes they do well on their math test, or she hopes that they'll, you know, not be a year behind on their reading. Now, I think that's all in there. She's a teacher. So, but, but what I hear in the story is those are second, third, fourth, fifth place to sort of the beatitude of, of meeting, <laughs> it is emotional, isn't it? Meeting them in their fear, in the valley of their own fear. And how can she impart by the grace of her own presence some measure of sort of bravery into the moment? And that you sometimes you're afraid and that's okay. You don't yeah. have, we don't have to rescue ourselves or each other from feelings just because they're not pleasant, right? You can be there. Now, you don't want to get stuck there necessarily, but like you can be there and that can be okay. And then you can also, when someone's ready, now with the children, Kristen's got to help them be ready before they might know they are, right? But like when they're ready, then you can help them walk out, right? Like yeah. I think that it's a companionship. Yeah, beautifully put. What Kristen talked about was what you mentioned last week, Henry, about the the stones. She had a relationship with the divine. Yeah. She knows her values. She processes them. She has a relationship. She was just trying to be nice. And so when she saw those kids again, it's really just seeing the kid. It's not seeing the challenges, like you said, we know that are probably going to be there yeah. for a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. So it it's it's like you get it before you have to deal with it so you're not threatened or Kristen will still get tired at times and want to strangle some of them. But, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's there. Yeah, yeah. Nicely put. I'm looking at uh, verse four. Blessed are are they those who mourn. Yeah. And um, you know, my parents have already died, and I grieve for them, and that's it. And I haven't lost any kids or siblings, so I'm not mourning in that sense. But sometimes I I really react to a news report of something that's that's really sad or or challenging, difficult. Um, if I read about a, the child in Lexington that was shot in the head and is blind mm. and going to kindergarten, you know, and yeah. I feel like, you know, these tears well up inside yeah. because I, I just feel so sad about things that are happening in our own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then there's all the government things and, um, you know, just, just news in general. There's a lot of stuff that we can mourn. And, you know, I can't go out there and fix the Capitol riot or any people that were there. Uh, you know, that's not going to be my responsibility, but I can mourn yeah. for what's happened. Yeah. That's beautifully put, Joyce. It's a vocation of Christians. What you're saying mirrors this back to me. It's a vocation of Christians, as especially as articulated in this beatitude, to be sad about sad things. Mm -hmm. Well, and that opportunity for mourning creates in itself opportunity. I mean, I lost my mom almost five years ago, and mm. I am a different human yeah. than I was before that. That changed how I process and how I think. And it is that working through the morning and that was not a fun or exciting or short process. And there are still days now that it, it gets really hard. Sure. And there are moments in which I will be angry that it is still very unfair, yeah. but the opportunity for growth that has existed. And even after losing her, I see more of those moments that Joyce references where Morning things in the outside world hit me harder because mm -hmm. I have experienced that true raw loss. But that opportunity gives me more place to give back. Yeah. Beautifully put, Meg. So, Meg, how is... God, that's really nicely put. 
um, thank you for that. How, how is how is being like how is being given the opportunity for growth through change you didn't want comforting? <laughs> well, it was either comforting or it was going to kill me. I didn't oh, have good. a choice in the matter. Amen. <laughs> so it's there. I I got to keep going and she didn't. So then it was all right, let's find all of the joy and moments that I can and f- allow myself to feel all of the pain that exists as well yeah. because I get to. Yeah. Hmm. Beautifully put. So there's um, there's a teacher whom I, I really really admire and have done a a bunch of work with it. His name is James Finley. And um, he's alive today and and teaching today. And he he has this this line and this teaching that I've adapted for myself for the Beatitudes. Um, And what Finley says is that the, the truth of our relationship with God is that we are invincibly precious in our brokenness. You, you don't have to get it right to be precious. You don't have to grow to be precious. You don't have to be sinless to be precious, you know. You don't have to have the right sort of view on the hot topics, as it were, to be precious. And in fact, what Finley is saying theologically is that we are invincibly precious to God, precisely in our brokenness. So, bless, so, so I sort of adapt that, like, bl- I think the Beatitudes, blessed are those who come into contact with their invincible preciousness in all of their brokenness. The brokenness that Meg describes that I, I, I've shared in myself, unfortunately, you know, um, causes us, if we have eyes to see, to recognize the invincible preciousness of ourselves in our brokenness. My friend who was poor in spirit and was about to go down the road to lament and think, oh, I'm just not getting this. What she realized was the invincibility of her preciousness in the midst of her brokenness. This is countercultural, y'all. I mean, to talk about discovering an operational value for a follower of Jesus Christ, walk into a room and look at everybody. And, and wordlessly acknowledge the invincible preciousness of everybody in the room, all of whom you may disagree with, a bunch of whom you hate, let's say. Y'all probably don't hate anybody, but the invincible preciousness of all of those people, and me too, in God's own heart, in the very midst of our brokenness. You know, Henry, um, in my work with families, um, one of the things that I'm working with parents to do is to recognize that it is in that their current lens is informed by their experiences growing up. Some of those experiences are hard. And you're right, it is countercultural because our culture tells us, first of all, it tells most of the dads I work with, no, we cannot deal with that. It has to be kept in a box. We're not allowed to cry. We're not allowed to experience anything. And some of the moms I work with also have that experience. Mm-hmm. But it's also, um, oh my gosh, this is so big. This is so awful. It has to be fixed this moment. Okay, so that's another cultural narrative. And I know as a parent myself that I had to look at the places where I was broken and where I had, you know, found my way out. And and that gave me the ability to be a better parent. And so it is the blessing of yeah. those things yeah. as opposed to the the building a wall of ourselves from those things. I, I see it as when I'm invited to walk in another shoes, mm. if I can draw at least a little bit, uh, my, I know your experience is different from mine, but if I can slow myself down, not use my program of happiness, which might be control or knowledge, 
and just be curious and accepting, then I can step into those shoes. Beautifully put. Puts me in the mind, Jane, of what we talked about last week, which is the shift from criticism to curiosity. When I'm, when I'm operating in that critical, that criticism mode, I'm, I'm wagging my finger at you and how can you believe that way? When I shift to curiosity, and the Beatitudes, I think, invite this, don't they? It's exactly what you're saying, I think, is then it, it gets honest and it's sincere. Like, now how can you believe this way? Could you tell me your story? Tell me who are your people? Where did you, where did you come up? And then I'll tell you mine. And now we're curious about each other's lives. And we're, I think we're, then we, we actually begin sort of unwittingly on my part, probably to, to live the Beatitudes. If you watched us, they go, oh gosh, Jane and Henry showed up kind of meek and, and uh, pure hearted and all kind of, wasn't that beautiful, you know? So Henry, I have a question. Is what, um, listening to, I think it was Virginia saying this before, because this is something I use a lot with my clients to help normalize. So, you know, they, these are the mountains, yep. okay? Mm-hmm. That that this is not life. We are not on this trajectory to this destination of happiness. But this is like the weather in Kentucky. It just mm-hmm. changes on a dime, okay? Our moods, our experiences. And so is what he's saying here in the Sermon on the Mount is you're not just blessed because you're down here, instead of up here, but you're blessed because you're down here and he's with you there? Yeah, and I think I think you're exactly on it. I think that's sort of a, a first step into it. And I think then what builds on that is, <laughs> what builds on that is, blessed are you when you're down there because he's with you. And what you'll come to know is that down there is up here. And up here is down there. And and the path of enlightenment for followers of Jesus is the sort of dismissal of that space-time continuum as we enter into, as we sort of drop into the flow of love. And then, and then, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of whatever may befall me, I fear no evil. Because whether I'm up or down or in between, you, O God, are with me. And, and when you're with me, I'm home. When you're with me, I'm home. And, 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 and the ground beneath my feet is like, take your shoes off, is holy ground. Yeah, yeah. Ann. I like what Jane, what you all got to there, because it gives me consistency. <clears throat> if I have the values that from love and what's most important to me is I don't have to go up and down all, all day. Right, right. I have emotion but I have something to put where to put it Right, is like when Kristen has a struggling day now with one of those kids, she's been there to the Valley. Yeah. So she's going to just be the same. That That's what it is for me. It's freedom just to be consistent. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I hate to interrupt. No, you, no, go. Is there a continuum here? Um, Unless you're poor in spirit and mourn and meek and hunger for thirst and righteousness, then you can be merciful and your heart is pure and you can be a peacemaker. I mean, if you don't have, if you don't have meek and mourn and poor, then can you be a peacemaker? You know, I mean... Do you have to start at the beginning of this in verse 1? Or is maybe verse 1, 2, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6? They're all things that are kind of the, the things you have to work on in order to be pure in heart? Yeah, that's a wow, that's a great question. I think we could certainly draw up an argument for a continuum. I mean, and it could be very helpful. Uh, we can do really anything. <laughs> you can use the Bible for anything you want to. That's one of the things we have to be honest about. I mean, you can, any of us can. Um, I think we could certainly drop a continuum argument. Um, 
for me personally, and others will have their, their own views, the, the variety here is not a continuum. It allows space. It, it's a big tent. It's a beatitude tent where it allows space for, um, some people are just not meek. They're just not. They'll never be meek a day in their lives. And, but, but they're doing exactly what God has them doing. I don't think anyone would call the Apostle Paul meek, right? He just wasn't meek. And thank God. Uh, the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who gave us some of the most clear teaching on the love ethic of Jesus that you can possibly imagine, um, was not in, in a single cell of his body meek. He was totally self-assured and thank God for it because you have to be totally self-assured if you're going to take on an entire religion, which is what he did. So, um, but, but also out of the other side of my mouth, I think it'd be really fun to sort of play around with the continuum, Joyce. So I think you've actually got a good idea. You probably could draw up a neat um, continuum. One of the things that compels me is the, the, the wisdom teachers who say, you, you're good at one thing. All you people who multitask and think, no, stop it. You're good at one thing. And maybe you have one beatitude. I mean, I don't know. I'm not trying to draw up a new orthodoxy. But, you know, I like the idea that it's a big tent and some of these are me and some of them are not. Um, and maybe some of them are me in different seasons or stages of life, too. Um, what, I, what I really, again, going back as we sort of wind down, going back to where we started with chapter 4, Jesus is straight up offered all the power. Young man, we can make you rich today. You know, that whatever your thing is, like he's offered it. And it's really kind of, um, how would I put it? It's kind of, um, it's kind of sassy what he does. It's kind of sassy. I mean, the Beatitudes are the absolute flip, just flip, totally flip the script of, of what he's offered in the desert. It's like, nope, in fact, not only no, but heck no, and here is the plan for the kingdom of God. You know, the last are going to be first, the first will be last. And, and I love the meek, because that's a leadership beatitude to me. He says very poetically, they will inherit the earth, which I symbolically translate as, they're the only ones who we should give any authority to. The ones who will not wield authority are the ones who should be given authority. The ones who don't want to be governor, bishop, principal, you know, captain of the ship, you know, head, whatever, the ones who don't want that, they're the ones who should be given the job. The meek are the ones whom Jesus says have what it takes to steward or husband. You know that old-fashioned word husband? I like that word. That's not about marriage. It's about husbanding, uh, stewarding, um, creation, and, and God's children. Um, welcoming the, the kindergartners, right, into the scary place. So you remember, we're on this search for our own values. And one of the reasons we're on this uh, bear hunt Chris and I use the bear hunt, and some, sometimes we're going on a bear hunt. Isn't that right? And you go under logs and over logs and all this kind of stuff. We're on a bear hunt for our own values. And one of the reasons we're on this hunt for our own values is because we're being torn apart in the culture wars. Because everybody just wants to know what I think about something and wants to know what Joyce thinks about something. And that's not getting us anywhere. We just keep fighting. And kind of to Anne's earlier point, I thought you shared this very beautifully, and it sort of gives you a place to live and be in peace. Issues come into town on a train, and they leave town on a train. That's my analogy. And, and they just, what was an issue 10 years ago? Oh, it's gone, and now there's another one. Politicians, with all due respect to all you politicians, I love you and I vote for you. But they come into town on a train, and they leave on a train. And they might come into town on a train, whether it's an issue or a person, and they might cause Ann and I to fight with each other, right? Because Ann believes this way and Hendry believes that way. Ann's more gracious than I am, so she wouldn't fight with me, but I'm just using her as an example. And the fact is, the issue that caused us to fight will leave on a train. And what will be left? Me and Ann. And our sore feelings. So what if we never take up the fight 
because we've committed ourselves to the discovery of our own values. And so when we walk into the room, Ann and I are like, oh, darn it. We got to go back to those beatitudes again. But it sets us free because we're after being pure in spirit and or poor in spirit and pure in heart and, and, and peacemakers. And then, darn it, we remember Joyce and her granddaughter. And it's like, oh, now we've got some real-world examples to sort of live into. And Kristen's story and Cindy's story and, and Meg's beautiful story about the death of her beloved mother, you know? And, and we spend so much time sort of in these operational values that the issues don't have their way with us. We have our way with them. And our way is to hold them all lightly. To, to you know, where justice needs to be meted out, we, we do that. Where the marginalized need to be gathered up, we do that. We, we reflect on our own prophetic test of Isaiah, the, the Ash Wednesday text from Isaiah. Has God saying through the prophet, I am tired, it literally says this, I am tired of your pointing of the finger and your name calling. <laughs> Y'all, that's a 3,000-year-old text. And it says what? It says, what I want to see is you taking the homeless poor into your own homes. What I want to see is you clothing the naked. What I want to see is you not hiding yourselves, read holding grudges, with your own kin. So peacemaker Joyce, right? In the family thing. No, really, really. And then, and then the, the, the prophet says, you remember what he says? Then you shall become, it's my favorite image in the whole Bible, you shall become like a watered garden, a peacemaker, a restorer of, the, of streets to live in, a repairer of the breach. That is our vocation as Christians. Now, what is a watered garden for a community? A watered garden in a community, think community garden, is a place where all can come for nurturance, sustenance, refreshment, and rest. But the garden must be watered. The prophet literally says watered garden. God says through the prophet. So the way we water ourselves, that we might become God's living garden, is to discover who in the heck it is we are. And what are our operational values? The Beatitudes are our starting place. Isn't it brilliant? What if on the first day of class, Kristen said to the students, she won't do this because it's not probably age appropriate, I'm not going to teach you how to read. I'm going to teach you how to love one another. And along the way, we will discover together how to read. You know? This is what Jesus is doing. I'm not going to teach you how to vote. I'm not going to teach you what's the right, you know, stance on the right issue. I'm going to teach you about your own invincible preciousness. Huh? No matter what, come hell or high water. And I'm going to teach you how to recognize the invincible preciousness of your siblings, all children of God. And along the way, we'll discover what we need to do on the hot topics. But that'll come. That'll come. So we're a little bit over an hour, and I like to hold us to that, but totally open to last words, any ha last comments, last illuminating things, questions, anything. So, um, I want to tell you about our next time together, but I've got to look at our schedule. Um, okay, so we're on the Beatitudes. Yeah, okay. So we're on the Beatitudes and today, and, to, and next week we're going to move on to Salt and Light, which is verses 13 through 16. In, in the Matthew text. But if you're following the Amy Jill Levine book, and you don't have to, but if you are, Amy Jill Levine doesn't quite go in order in this one little place. So you're not just reading what's next in Amy Jill Levine's book. You actually have to skip a few pages um, over to, I think it's page 45. 
but it's in the schedule. So go to the website and the schedule is correct. So if you just read uh, chapter two in Amy Jill Levine's, it doesn't make you a bad person, but you're not going to have read what we're going to look at next week. You got to follow the schedule because there's a little skip um, in the way I've laid out this particular study. It's a little different from the way she's laid it out, if that makes sense. But just go to the schedule on the website, look for the dates. It's all correct on the website. Um, so I, my, my prayer for you all this week is that you just keep doing what you're doing in as much as you're using the Beatitudes to look at your own life and not being discouraged by when mourning comes upon you, uh, sadness or, or, or poverty of spirit or, or, or any of these things where you might feel less than. But sort of let Jesus in the Beatitudes flip the script on it. Um, and when the beloved is is dead more than that, but also know that, oh my gosh, I'm going to grow through this. Like there's a preciousness that I'm going to meet in this. And that's the very invincibility of all of your inherent preciousness, especially in the midst of your brokenness. So love you. God bless you. And we'll see you next Sunday. Peace.